I, uh, I get an opportunity to introduce a first-time speaker here at, uh, at Salem Fields. And so uh, when, I, uh, when I was praying about taking the church here at Salem Fields Community Church, uh, God gave me a word, and the word is belong. And, uh, you know, that has shaped who we are and how we do church. And as I was going through the process of taking the church and had accepted the church, uh, God gave me a couple of names of a couple of people that we should get on the team. And we were looking at the team and making sure we get the right people in the right spots on the team. But one of the people that God uh, kind of sent to my mind was Carrie Dillman. Carrie Dillman had served as a children's pastor at my uh, last previous church, and, and then she went on uh, to be a next generation pastor at a large church in Woodbridge. And as I was thinking about uh, next generation and rethinking the way that we do uh, from cradle all the way to 18 and beyond and how we have to be very strategic in that ministry, uh, God just brought Carrie to my mind and it was a uh, 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 privilege to hire her back to work with her again. And she's helping us to rethink and to think better on how we take our people from the cradle to 19, 18, 19 years old. Here's the really sad thing about the church. And this is big C, why, that there's a situation, that's a phenomenon that's going on, that people come and they jump in early on. They're letting us know they're there early on, and uh, they go into 18 or 19, and something that happens is strange. They leave the church, and then they come back when they have their own kids, and they come back to church, and, and they jump back in the church, and, and I just believe that that doesn't have to happen. I believe that we can, uh, we can minister to people in such a way that they are in church and they never leave church. At 18 and 19, they keep on serving, they keep on giving, they keep on going, and they become a vital part of the church. And, um, and I'm so glad that we have someone on our team who, who loves that, who dreams about that, and who's working to help us get rid of that bad phenomenon. Would you give a warm Salem Fields welcome to Pastor Carrie Dillman as she comes? <laughs> Well, thank you, Pastor James, and good morning, everybody. Good morning. I am so, oh, that was great. You guys are awake and ready. Um, I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad to have this opportunity to chat with you, and, and while I'm up here, I just wanted to say, like, you walk around the church, and we walk around our neighborhoods, and we go around, probably even in your homes, and I would say that it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Very good. You guys read my notes? Yes, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. And you know, there's all these different things that people have that remind them and get them excited about Christmas. And so we're going to do a little activity. I do next gen ministry, as he said, so I'm used to interacting. And so you guys are going to be a part of this. And so there's going to be some pictures on the screen. And when you see these pictures, what I need you to do is you can give me a thumbs up, you can clap, you can raise your hand if it's something for you that gives you all those feelings that Christmas is coming. Now, if you're watching online, you can participate too. You can just jump into the chat. You can give a smiley face, give a thumbs up, make a comment, and let us know, is this what makes you think of Christmas? So let's jump right in. Okay, let's do our first one. Christmas lights. Anybody? Yes. Yeah, me too. I love good Christmas lights, and I'm actually really excited. I'll be sending you guys the Fredericksburg light map that we've put together with all the some of the best lights to go see and so yes christmas lights are fun joy 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 to the world this is the season of advent is actually the week of joy so that's one of them gingerbread houses we love gingerbread houses in our house so the same before in the previous service that we have two well, we had two now we have like 1.25 my one daughter decides that she should early eat and start to take apart one of her gingerbread houses. But we do love gingerbread house making. Christmas presents, right? You give them, you receive them. It's a wonderful part. Jesus got gifts. We know this is a part of Christmas. Christmas caroling. Yes, we're singing. Now, literally, we have Christmas carols that say, we wish you a Merry Christmas. It's the only time you'll hear me sing, like here on this. <clears throat> the, Ah, decorating the tree. Yes. 
If you were part of our Christmas at the Fields, you had lots of experience with trees. And we loved every part of it, and we're awesome to be able to do that. But yes, decorating Christmas trees is all about Christmas. Now, how about this one? Okay, Jesus, right? This is a depiction. Jesus' birth is the reason that we get to even celebrate. I mean, what is Christmas without Jesus? You know this one, okay? Fear. Anybody? Now, this one didn't have quite the overwhelming response that all of our other ones had, but do you know that for some people, feelings of fear and feelings like this fill the time that leads up to and just surrounds all of Christmas. And honestly, fear is something that we see woven into the story that recounts the very first Christmas as well. Now, Over the past few weeks, Pastor James has been taking us on a Christmas journey together from Moses to the manger. And we have dug into this idea and understanding that the birth of Jesus, our rescuer, started long before the stories were told in these months leading up to his birth. The plan for God to rescue his people was always the plan. And Jesus was always the answer. And you know, God loves us so much that he had this plan to move us from oppression to promise and to call us into places where we would learn and grow from acts of sacrifice and obedience. And we're going to focus our time here today to talk about how God helps us to not be stuck in a position, a state, or a mindset of fear, but to walk in faith because of Jesus, this baby that was born. Now, there's a lot of different definitions of fear, so I do think it's important that we kind of come together and know what it is we're talking about. Because one definition that you'll even see in the Bible is actually this feeling of respect, of great awe. And this is a really good thing. That type of fear is something that you want to move toward, not move from. And the Bible affirms over and over that this gives life, it gives knowledge, it gives wisdom. So God tells us that having a great respect and awe of him is good. It's good because it brings him glory, which is the purpose of our lives, to bring glory to God, glory to God in the highest. But the fear that we're going to talk about today is different. It's that fear that we saw in the slide just a moment ago. It's the fear that most of us think of when we feel scared and we feel afraid. And for some of us, simply hearing the word can cause us to even have some sensations that just overwhelm us. We have our mind wander to times when we were in danger, when we had anxious, worry-filled thoughts and fearful feelings. And fear, you know, it's one of those strange things that it can start off small. But if it stays, it builds and it rises to the top. And you know, it gets in the way. And sometimes it doesn't just get in the way, it moves us from where the thing is that was triggering us, that gave us that fear, good or bad, and we move away from it. And so I probably don't need to tell you this, but the world that we live in is full of scary things that can cause a lot of fear. I mean, most of us have been through, many of us are still going through, and some of us are about to go through some scary hard things. And we can get overwhelmed with worry. Fears of things like unknowns, fears of complications, fears of things being out of our control, fear of a person, fear of financial situations, fear of sickness, fear of loss. There's fears upon fears upon fears. And we've all been there at some point in time. And this isn't just the thing of right now, and it's not even just the thing of 2020, even though fear is on the rise. This battle of the mind This is something that's happened since the beginning. And God's people have struggled with this. In fact, God knew this and he put it in his word. So many times, hundreds of times, you'll see the command. Do not fear. Fear not. Do not be afraid. And you know, when God repeats something, I think it's probably something really important that we should focus on. And I also believe that God does not say things only to be heard, but to be obeyed. And so we're going to take a look at how fear is shown in this story from Moses to the manger. 
and how God's people move from fear to faith. And not just how they did it, but how we can also do that too. So if you have your Bible or a Bible app, I invite you to read with me today. Now we're going to start in Exodus chapter 14, verse 19. I think they put it on the screens too. Yep. And I am in the ESV if you're trying to match up with me in your app. <clears throat> now before I jump in, I want to tell you where we're at in this journey. So this is the part of Moses' journey. When the Israelites had been slaves to the Egyptians, they had been through all the plagues that God brought to Pharaoh. And they even had been freed from the death and spared. Their children were spared from death. And so now we get through that final plague. And Pharaoh finally says, just go, go. And they went. And so God leads them with a pillar of fire and a cloud and they're finally free. They're on their way to the promised land. And so now, in this situation where Pharaoh initially said, go, and he let them go, things are changing. And Pharaoh decides that he's going to tell his army to go back and go get Moses and go get the Israelite people. And so this is where we're at in Exodus 14, chapter 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. Now for me, when I'm scared and I'm crying out to God, there's some things that I'll probably say. Let's see if the Israelites said something similar to maybe what you think would be a good thing to say. They said to Moses, God's messenger here, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone, that we may serve as slaves to the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. The Israelites bring an extreme amount of sass to their questioning. They do not have respect and awe for God at this moment. They're kind of more like if you look at fight or flight, I think they're fight. They're scared and they're angry. And so now Moses is kind and has sound mind. And he replies to them in that and says to God's people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel, go forward, lift up your staff, and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, so that they will go in after them, and I will give, get glory over Pharaoh and all of his hosts, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And when I've gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. So here we have the Israelites, free from this terrible life they had as slaves to the Egyptians. They're following the plan. They are going through the wilderness. But then the view of God's plan seems to get a little bit harder. And things don't seem as good as they did before because now they see an army coming. They hear the army marching. And you know, this plan that seemed like a pretty good one before doesn't seem to be working out so well for them, and they have doubt. And you know, this isn't just like a little seed of doubt. This is straight up, let's go back to the terrible life that we had before, and rather than trusting God. This situation, I will say, it does seem terrible. And I agree that this situation seems impossible. They are scared, and they are filled with fear, and fear that God can't do what he said he would. Fear that now they'd have to get through this journey out of their own strength. They're questioning God and where he has them now. And I'm going to stop right here for just a moment. I think it's really important to point out that although we see the presence of fear in this story, I want you to be clear as day that God does not give fear. He is not the author of fear. God's word is clear. It tells us that he doesn't give a spirit of fear but he gives us power and love and sound mind. So fear is present with the Israelites. It's prompted by a change in circumstances and in 
increased possibility of danger, but this fear is not from God. So back to Moses. We have the Israelites, and they're faced with unknowns and impossible challenges, and their response is fear and to question. God's messenger, Moses, he follows with a message for them. These are God's chosen people who we know he has a plan and a purpose for. And Moses shares with them some commands and instructions. He says, do not fear. Stand firm. Be still. And he continues with a promise. He says, shift your gaze. Look at my promises. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. The Lord will fight for you. God does not hear their questions and leaves them. He doesn't see them scared and, you know, says, you know what, I'm going to wash my hands of this. I changed my mind. God speaks through his servant Moses. And I love how he works here because he's given them not everything, not every detail, not every single part and every step. He gives them what they need to hear. And now it's time for them to respond. Now, you may be thinking what he asked them to do was kind of passive or simple. I mean, he literally said, stand up, be quiet. I mean, how hard is that, right? But I can tell you I've been standing for a little bit today. And let's be real. When we go to a restaurant and we've got, like, I don't know, a five-minute wait, what are we looking for? A place to sit, right? And maybe a little bit annoyed if, like, why is the people all spread out in these chairs? I want to sit. If you're in a waiting room, they have chairs so you can sit. Outside of stores and shopping malls, there's benches so people can sit. Because standing takes effort. It's intention. It requires us to engage our body and our senses to stand. God told the Israelites to do something that I think, honestly, is harder than responding in our flesh, than reacting. It would have been easier to just run away or to suit up and fight. But he's calling them to have self-control, a sound mind to wait on the Lord and to depend on him, to trust him and to stand firm. Not to waver and kind of check up on a backup plan, to look around for other options to survive, to stand, stand firm. And then he goes on and helps them. He helps them to replace these complaints and cries with quiet watching. See the salvation of the Lord. Don't look at the enemy that's coming towards you. Don't look at what's scaring you. Look at the promises of God. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. The Lord will fight for you. And the story goes on, and we learned that he did just that. I mean, he did it in ways that they never, ever could have done in their own strength. He hardens the heart of Pharaoh's army. He parts the sea so they can pass on dry land and gives them exactly the amount of time they need to pass. And then he returns the waters to their place to conquer the army that was coming after them. So the Israelites, I believe, had a pretty reasonable stance to have fear. But when the time came, when they had these promises and they had this command, they choose to stand firm. They choose to walk. They responded in faith, and then, in fact, they did see the salvation of the Lord that day. They, he worked for them, and it was a miracle. And you know, there's another miracle we're going to look at today, and it is from the book of Luke. And this is where the story is beginning, telling of Jesus's birth. And so we're in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph from the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he called to her, and he came and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And so Mary says to the angel, how will this be? I mean, I'm still a virgin. And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. And behold, 
your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So we have Mary, who's engaged to Joseph, living her life, obediently following God. And I'm sure she has a plan for getting married and probably having this family and this great thriving carpentry business. Whatever it is that she has in her eyes of what will happen suddenly changes. The circumstances change and the situation in front of her is not only seeming impossible, but a bit troubling. Because, you see, Mary is engaged, but she isn't married. And in her time, this was a very potentially dangerous, dangerous situation for her life. Joseph, the man she was engaged to, could choose to publicly shame her. And once he finds out that she's having a child and it's not his... And so this could result in her being stoned and could quite possibly end in death. So not only is she wondering, physically, literally, how can this be? She has some circumstances that come along with this that create an extremely challenging situation and impossible circumstances. So now Mary, just like the Israelites, she's faced with unknowns and possible challenges. And and what is her first response? Similar to the Israelites, she feels fear. And she does question, but I give her some credit because she does take a little less sass than what they did. She just simply asks, how can this be? And God again sends a messenger. He has a message for her and responds and says, do not be afraid. God chose you. You will have a son by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he will be the son of God. She's given a promise to rely on as well. Her promises for nothing will be impossible with God. With that, it's Mary's time to respond. So God told her what she needed to know, not every detail, not every part. And she got what she needed to stand firm and follow him on this journey. And so she responds, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Now, we've looked at these stories of Moses and the Israelites and Mary, and we see this same pattern, right? We're seeing impossible circumstances, fear and questioning. God speaks, do not fear. Then there's promises and instructions, and then there's a time for his people to respond. But this doesn't just happen with Moses and Mary. We see this again with Joseph and We see this in lives in the Old and New Testament all over the place. And so, as we've looked into these stories from Moses to the manger, we're seeing that there's a very real fear that is woven into and out of God's story, this story of Christmas, this redemption story. And I would take a guess that there's a pretty good chance that you have encountered fear as a part of your story at some point in time too. I know that it's woven its way into mine. But like we talked about earlier, although we may see and we may feel a very real presence of fear, we can be confident knowing that God does not give fear. He is not the fear maker. He is the way maker. He makes a way by parting the Red Sea so the Egyptians can walk on dry land. He makes a way for Mary and Joseph to follow God's plan so Mary can give birth to Jesus, our Savior. And I can tell you, he's making a way so that we too can stand firm when we're faced with scary, impossible, fearful things so that we can have a sound mind and remember the promises of God so that we can stand upon them and we can replace our thoughts of doubts and the lies that Satan tells us with the truth of his word. So when worries and doubts and anxious fears fill our hearts and minds, let's draw something from what we heard today. One of those first things is, I want you to remind yourself of who you are. We are chosen. Not just Mary, not just Moses, Not just the Israelites, not just any number of people you can see in the Bible or pastors or whoever you may see. We are all chosen. God loved us all so much that he sent his son, Jesus. 
And we should all, it says in Thessalonians that we should always give thanks to God because God chose you from the beginning to be saved. We know that he chose us from the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. And then in 1 Peter 2.9, it says that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you may proclaim the excellencies, glory to God in the highest, of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, out of fear and into faith, out of worry and doubt and into trust. God is love, and God loves us. And in his word, we know that perfect love casts out fear. And so we as his chosen people, that he has a purpose and a plan for, that he sent his one and only son Jesus to come to earth as a baby in human form out of ma- in a manger, in the middle of what looked like impossible circumstances and challenges to rescue us from our fears, from our doubts, from the darkness that our sin traps us in and keeps us separated from God. So when there was fear, God spoke through his messengers. He speaks to us through his word. Do not fear. You are chosen. So if we want to stand firm, I want us to remember his love for us, that he is love. And to not be stuck in this holding pattern of fear, let's remember who we are. We are God's children, dearly loved, sons and daughters of the king. We are chosen. And now second, we need to replace. We need to replace our cries and our complaints and our words of doubts and fear. What is true from God's word can do that for us. Hebrews 4.12 tells us that God's word is powerful. It is living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword and discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And we know that it also says that God's word does not return void. God is going to do good work. And this means that when we take the Bible, when we read it, when we speak it, when we pray it, when we memorize it, when we delight in it, something is going to happen. And I don't know if many of you know this, but I have a psychology background, and specifically in behavioral psychology. And one of the things that you get to do in that field is we get to work a lot with people and helping them to deal with inappropriate, unhealthy, unwanted actions or thoughts. And one of the strategies that we use to do that is replacement, where we help them to replace the behaviors. But what we've seen over and over again is a lot of times we can get the behavior to stop, the unwanted, unhealthy thing. But if you don't train and learn and teach a healthy one to replace it with, it's going to be replaced. But oftentimes it's replaced with something else, unhealthy, unwanted, that is not a good thought or action. And so it takes intention. It takes intention and time and training. And you know, it's not something you're just going to find in psychology today or at a local doctor's office. What you see here, we see this with the Israelites. We saw this with Mary. They had cries and worries and doubts, and God replaced them with his promises. He said, do not fear, stand firm. I will fight for you. See the salvation of the Lord. He replaced Mary's, how can this possibly be, with for nothing is impossible with God. And so finally, something else we can take from this is to respond. We need to respond whether naturally you're a fight or flight or freeze up person, God has a bigger plan than what you can or would naturally do in your own flesh. And he has a purposeful journey to take you on. And it's not limited to your own strength. It's not limited to your past. It's not limited to your failures. It's not limited to anything but your response. Because we cannot do this on our own and in our own strength, facing fear and this world that has scary, hard things. And you know what? I would venture to tell you that it won't happen if you just hear today and do nothing with it. Whether you're here and you hear these words week after week, 
or if it's your first time that you've heard the story of God's love from Moses to the manger, you can choose to never actually do anything with it. I mean, to simply hear and not obey. You see, you may not know this, but we have a very real enemy. His name is Satan. And he has a targeted attack to us to steal, kill, and destroy. And he wants to use things. Use things that are familiar to us, like insecurities, like doubts, impossible circumstances, fears, to cripple us and cut us at the knees and cause us not to stand firm. To make us not remember God's love and who we are in him. To move us thinking that we have to do things in our own power and out of our own flesh. And to not quietly watch with a sound mind. God knew this would happen. He told us in John 16, 33, that in this world, you will have trouble. But he doesn't stop there. The verse goes on, and this is just like he didn't stop with the Israelite people, telling them, just don't fear. And he didn't stop with Mary and just said, don't be afraid. This continued on this journey to the manger, and I can tell you he's not going to stop with you. Because he says, yes, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have fear, anxiety, and danger. But he goes on and says, take heart. Because I, Jesus, this baby that was born on the manger, the reason we celebrate Christmas, has overcome the world. And this is because the journey to the manger didn't stop at the manger. It continued on, and that journey went from creation to Moses to the manger to the cross, where Jesus died and took on the sin of the world, and that's you and me and everyone, so that we could live forever because of him and his perfect love for us. And you know what? God's perfect love, when we have that, fear does not stand a chance. And just like everyone else on this journey today, you have a chance to respond. Now maybe you've been sitting here and you're just thinking, you know, she does not know me. She has no clue what kind of fears I have in my life, what kind of terrible circumstances I have gone through that I wouldn't even speak out loud. And I can tell you, you're right. I don't. I don't know. But what I do know is I know who does. And I not only know who does, I know he is good. And I know that he loves you so much. And if you're filled with anxious fears and doubts and worries, know that God gives us. He gives us great things here, resources and counselors and, and so many good things that are available to us to help us work through these things that we should 100% use. But I'm going to tell you that all that work and all of that help and all of these things are going to do nothing and go nowhere without the sustaining, true power and love of Jesus. So if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you haven't taken the step of trusting God as your king and taking in what he has for you, living in his power and love, you can make that decision today. You can respond and choose to put your trust in Jesus as your savior, to have forgiveness from your sins, and live with him in your life forever. Now, if you're a believer, you're sitting here, and you might be wondering, okay, <clears throat> I know him. What's my response? Well, I have a question for you. You know him, but are you growing in him? Are you sharing the love that you have with others? Are you coming in on Sunday mornings and participating in these great worship services and coming to events and never actually telling anybody about this Jesus that you love, that has saved you? Is God asking you to do something for him? Are you sitting and wondering, I don't know. I want to know. I want to, I want to do God's will. I want to be his servant. Lord, use me. Well, remember, God does not speak only to be heard. He speaks to be obeyed. And he has a word for everyone. And so I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to pray for us. And I'd ask that you would think and consider and pray along with me. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just want to thank you. God, I thank you so much. I thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son, Jesus. 
And you loved us so much that you give us the power to stand firm in your love and to stand firm because of everything that you do and have done and will do for us. And God, I pray for anyone who is listening online or who is here in this place today, God, who doesn't know you as their Savior, who hasn't made a decision to trust in you, God, and I pray, God, that they would pray with me right now because they can choose to respond and they can choose to walk in faith, God. And so if that is you, pray with me. Dear God, we thank you for who you are and that you are king of kings and that you sent your son Jesus to be born in a manger to die for my sins. And God, I want to live for you you forever. God, thank you for what you're doing. God, thank you for the good work that you will do. We trust you and we love you. And God, I want to pray for everyone here who who is firm in their faith, who is new believers, who who know you, God. I pray that we would not be content to just sit and hear. God, let us be doers of the word. God, let us take action steps in our faith, Lord. Please break our hearts to what breaks yours and help us to respond. God, I pray that our response would be an action towards fear and awe of you and respect of you, God, to give you all the glory in everything that we do for Spotsy, everything that we do for our families, for our friends, for whoever you've put around us, Lord. Let us speak the name of Jesus, and let us share about this wonderful love that we have and why we celebrate Christmas. God, I pray and I trust that you will do and you will work in all things. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask the band to come back up. And while they do, I want you to take a look. There's pieces of paper on random seats, and there's pens around. And I want you to take this moment as we prepare to sing, and and I want you to take some time to pray. Pray, talk to God, sing to him, but use this as an opportunity. Take this piece of paper, and maybe you want to write for yourself something that God spoke to you and put on your heart, something that you need to remember that you're chosen, that he loves you, that you are a son or daughter of the king and that you can stand on his promises. You can put that up on a window, remind it for yourself in your mirror, whatever you want to do, keep that and slide it in your Bible as a reminder. But you also may have today made a decision. You may have decided that today is the day that you want to trust and follow Jesus. And if you did that, we want to celebrate with you. We want to help you take next steps on your journey. And so we ask that you would we would mark that and share it with us. And we can walk with you in it. And, and if the Lord has put something on your heart or ministry to, to follow him, or, or maybe this has brought up a lot of questions for you. And you're thinking, I, I need help. I need someone to talk to. Our team is here. Our church is here. We're a family. We want to do this work together. And so know that we love you and that we want you to share that with us. We ask that you would consider marking that down. And so as we move into this time of response, you know, I want you to remember something. God loves you. He has chosen you. He has a plan for you. And he's waiting for you to respond. Would you stand and sing with us? My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. See that again. It's my feet. Doesn't stand a chance when I stay on in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stay on in your 
bound by fear, be bound by anxiety, Lord, but we just have to rest in you and trust in you and trust in your goodness. So I pray that you would just continue to help us fix our eyes on you, Lord, above all else, knowing your goodness and your faithfulness. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you so much for being here today and if you made a decision and you want to let us know about it and you filled out that card, and we just want to encourage you to drop them in those buckets just so we can be able to encourage you, pray for you, uh, just really get you uh, connected or just really just really give you advice based off of what you wrote on that card. And so we just want to encourage you to do that. But we love you guys. We're praying for you. We'll see you right back here next week and take care.